Hey, everybody. Hello. <laughs> um, so um, we should probably start by saying that the, the title here, How to Research and Design for Humans, Not Users, is, is a little misleading. We're going to have some pointers and some experience, but really, um, I think after this, the, the goal is to have questions, because we have a lot. We have a lot in terms of everything that we've done and the work that we do. The more we do in our research and our design, the more questions that actually come up. And that's hopefully the experience that you have here, too. Um, I'll just do the arrow. Awesome. So uh, that's us in the woods. Um, and this, this is helpful to know a little bit of background about why we're called Woods Creative and why we decided to uh, put this on our home page. This is our home page photo. Um, we're named Woods because we really, a lot of our work, we really believe in the method of exploration um, and interconnectedness and the beauty that the woods provides. And, you know, that may sound a little lofty because it is, uh, but it's our company and we can do that. Uh, and, and our clients tend, tend to agree with us. And I think on a more serious note is one of the reasons that we founded Woods Creative two years ago was because we think in this increasingly connected world that we're actually more disconnected. Um, in the work that we do and the users, humans, that we talk to, uh, we find that there's much disconnection between people. And sometimes that starts to render itself in the work. And what we try to do is really find that emotional element, that human element in what we do. And like I said, uh, as we go through this, you know, your questions for us are going to help us iterate on this. We want to make this presentation better and even more importantly, our work better and try to have some different perspectives. The talk will last about 30 minutes or so. We'll leave us 10 minutes or so for, for questions afterwards. And we may actually interrupt each other. That's kind of our process. Um, I'm sure I'll forget something that Amy needs to remind me of um, and, uh, and uh, vice versa. So what are we going to do today? Uh, first, you know, we're all here um, because we work in really the business of communication and human communication. And this first part, uh, we're really going to do something a little unconventional. We're going to go way back to the basics here. We're going to talk a little bit about what a good human experience is outside of the digital realm, outside of the product realm in some cases. But what are good human experiences? What are memorable? What makes a good human experience? And there are many, many, many qualities. But what we've done is narrow it down to, I think, five that really kind of, um, kind of talk a little bit about what a good human experience is. And then what we're going to do is after we show you this, what we think is a good human experience, kind of show a product or a digital design where we think that human experience renders itself and what we consider to be good examples of understanding human communication and human experience. Now, at this point, too, I want to mention that we're going to try to use the term HX instead of UX. We're not trying to change the industry name. You know, uh, we understand it's called user experience. The reason we do this and the reason we try to do this with our clients as much as possible is because it just changes your frame of mind a little bit. And I suggest you try this, too, uh, in some of your own projects. When you change user experience to human experience, there's a little bit of a different element, a little bit of a different type of intuition that you have as you approach your work. So that's the terminology we're going to try to use through this. So after we go through that, we're going to talk a little bit about what we're learning. How are we learning about it? What are, what are we learning as we go through our projects in HX design? And how we're learning it. This is we're going to talk about two case studies, uh, two clients that we've worked with, um, and what we've learned from our interviews with people, our field studies, and how that's really influenced the design decisions that we've made. And then finally, a conclusion where we have some discussion and questions, and then how we rethink, um, how, and really rethinking how HX design can redefine ROI. So for the first part, Amy's going to take it over here and talk a little bit about some good human experiences and how that relates itself to some product examples. So uh, back to the basics, it immerses you. This is a sample we found at the ICA in Boston. It's called The Visitors. And what it is is a bunch of musicians that got together and they sat in these different rooms and they improved this amazing musical experience. And as the viewer, you could walk within this space that mimicked much what a house would be like, and you could see these people playing, and you felt like you were part of that spatial experience with them. And in the digital realm, the, the Fitbit, a lot of us have this. 
It's a device that we wear on our wrist, like one of these. And it immerses you into your own data. It immerses you into this experience on your phone that is much like the physical space, but in a much more data-driven space. Our second point, it provides clear, limited, and confident presentation of choice. So a good human experience might be something like the tiny house movement. This is a physical space where you have to make choices. And I really liked this quote. The Leonardo da Vinci said, small rooms or dwellings discipline the mind, large ones weaken it. So we see these different spaces that have very different designs, but it gives us that limited choice that's very impactful based on our own lifestyles and what we need as humans. And then another example of clear, limited choice might be something, a, a website called Studio A Revisited, which is Bob Dylan's creative process work from 1965 to 1966. And this is a sample of what that might be like, uh, or what it is, an award-winning site that talks about the jam sessions, uh, the listening sessions, and the singing sessions. And what's very impactful about this site, like other simple sites, is that you have very clear and limited choice that really brings you through his creative process. It inspires you. Gosh, this one was really fun. Uh, Strand Beasts. Has anyone heard of Theo Janssen, Strand Beasts? He's an amazing artist, uh, engineer, communicator, and he's created these new forms of life out of PZP pipe and plastics and wind and flat ground that's found on the beach. And we actually have a small clip that we want to show you. For those of you who have not seen his work, it's remarkable. So it inspires you in this way that makes you create, maybe think of things in a very different way, right? But there's also things like the surging sea mapping, which might inspire you to take action in a very different way, maybe out of fear. So this site example is surging seas, where you can put in your zip code, and you can see at 4 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius warmer um, for our climate change, what part of your, your zip code might be underwater this might inspire someone to take some action towards this cause. And then it conveys simplicity and beauty. We all know the Eames chairs. There's probably Eames chairs in our offices. But what was so beautiful about the work that they did is they really embraced material. They embraced the raw form of plastics and reshaped them and used metals and woods in completely different ways in the 60s and 50s when this is just becoming part of the vernacular. In comparison to the materials of a new product that's going to be launched in 2017 of spring named uh, Product Chicard. And Project Chicard is a woven uh, technology within, within a jacket and you can swipe on the jacket and something will happen. So you can silence your phone, you can uh, maybe play music. But these are new technologies we're going to start seeing as we get more integrated.
And as we were discussing and creating this presentation, we found that uh, if a good experience provides welcome challenge. So uh, a welcome challenge that we saw is something like the Dutch reach. And the purpose of this is a new form of human behavior where if you just open your car door with your right hand versus your left hand, you might see a biker that could come by and not door them. And it's a simple tweak in this behavior that could influence other behaviors. And lest we forget the click wheel, this was very challenging when it came out. The click wheel was never seen before, at least in the product space for consumers. And so why did we show you that? Uh, and really, I think what, what our challenge is um, as user experience specialists and designers is how do we translate some of those truisms? And there are a lot more than that. But how do we translate those truisms of human behavior and human experiences that we might qualify as good to the experiences that we build and that we design? And one of the things that, that um, we argue is that there is sometimes a tendency to not dive into that gray area, not to make the, the connections between, say, a museum exhibit, as you saw the first one, that immerses you, to what Fitbit does, that also immerses you into very different things, and to then argue those, those connections to our clients. Sometimes we over-rely on the quantitative. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. Quantitative is, is important. You know, We need that data to do our work. But in the world of big data, sometimes we over-rely on that just a little too much. And this next clip we're going to show, this is the last of two clips that we're going to show, really kind of get at um, what we're talking about. Gentlemen, open your text, page 21 of the introduction. Mr. Perry, will you read the opening paragraph of the preface entitled Understanding Poetry? Understanding Poetry by Dr. J. Evans Pritchard, Ph.D. To fully understand poetry, we must first be fluent with its meter, rhyme, and figures of speech, then ask two questions. One, how artfully has the objective of the poem been rendered? And two, how important is that objective? Question one rates the poem's perfection. Question two rates its importance. And once these questions have been answered, determining the poem's greatness becomes a relatively simple matter. If the poem score for perfection is plotted on the horizontal of a graph and its importance is plotted on the vertical, then calculating the total area of the poem yields the measure of its greatness. A sonnet by Byron might score high on the vertical, but only average on the horizontal. A Shakespearean sonnet, on the other hand, would score high both horizontally and vertically, yielding a massive total area, thereby revealing the poem to be truly great. As you proceed through the poetry in this book, practice this rating method. As your ability to evaluate poems in this manner grows, so will, so will your enjoyment and understanding of poetry. Excrement. That's what I think of Mr. J. Evans Pritchard. We're not laying pipe. We're talking about poetry. I mean, how can you describe poetry like American bandstand? Well, I like Byron. I give him a 42, but I can't dance to it. <laughs> so we mean this as a, as, a, as a kind of a funny example. As sometimes when we're, when we're creating human things, when we're creating experiences for human beings, that we might start to become a little overly formulaic in our approach. So how can we avoid being formulaic in our work um, so we research and design for humans? So first is context really still matters. Um, you know, I, I think it's important when we talk to people, uh, when we do our user research, to really understand how people communicate and when they communicate and when they're going to be engaging with whatever experience that we're building. Now, this isn't to say that we need to have a mobile site and a desktop site. You know, we understand responsive design. Uh, we understand um, building mobile first in a lot of cases, but sometimes that neglects context. Sometimes that neglects how I'm going to use a device in certain circumstances. Just think of an email that you receive from, your, from someone's phone as opposed to their desktop. The way the words are used 
the brevity, uh, often the in-depth uh, conversation that might occur on a desktop is simply different than a phone. Or think of the design decisions you might have to make when someone comes to you and says, you know what, we really want to use parallax. Well, um, I'm still waiting for a good parallax experience. But when you're, <laughs> unless it's you know, a, 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 you know, a game, in those kinds of situations, context does matter. Parallax on a phone might not make sense to do the job that you need to do. Um, even things such as social icons. You know, when you have most people just simply copying and pasting a URL, depending on when they're accessing that experience and when they're going to share it. Context matters. And how they're living their lives and what part of their day they're engaging with your experience really matters. Human behavior is often misread. And I don't think this is really surprising to a lot of people, but when we talk about certain metrics such as time on site, just because someone's using a lot, spending a lot of time on site doesn't mean they're having a good time. Doesn't mean that time is well spent. Click rates, it's another example. Yes, we want to convert, especially if you have an e-commerce client, you want to make sure that we're converting. But sometimes people are clicking on things that they don't want to click on. Sometimes they do it out of frustration. And for years in my career, and I've been doing this for you know, 15 plus years now, is it was always bad when someone went to search. Well, I've seen recently in the last few years when you have a good website, if you're building a website, and they have a great idea of the homepage and they go to search, that's actually a win in a lot of cases because they know and they have the confidence that your experience is delivering on the content that they're trying to find. And it used to be, we have too many people going to search, our site isn't delivering. Well, sometimes that's the exact opposite. And actually, I want to go back on, on this one, too. Just as a, a quick aside, I first realized this. I was working on, um, we were actually doing a readability analysis of the Medicare and You handbook in 2006, when the prescription drug benefit first came to be. And we did our readability analysis, and we found that it was written at a much higher grade level than it should be. And we thought, OK, here are some words that we need to change, some more industry-specific words. And as a qualitative uh, part of the study, we actually spoke to Medicare recipients and their caregivers. And there were two different occasions when there were um, you know, a recipient, and they were probably in their 80s, and with a caregiver, which was in, in both cases, their son or their daughter, in their 40s. And we were, they were going through, and part of the question was, you know, you know, take your time and read this passage, and in your own words, when you're ready, tell me what you, what you think this passage is about. And in both cases, the seniors started crying because it was so confusing. It was so impossible to understand. And it was no longer about the copy that was used in the handbook. It was no longer about whether we defined formulary in the glossary. It was about this emotional reality that the Government Accountability Office had to hear. That you have, a, you are, you have human beings interacting with this handbook already at an emotional state of frustration and confusion. And it was that finding, and the data helped, don't get me wrong, but it was that finding which really, really caused some national news to make some changes to the Medicare handbook. Digital is part of a larger experience. Um, I think a lot of times we have clients come to us, and you may too, and say, we need a website. And you say, okay, great. Um, we had a great creative director years ago who said, uh, whenever someone comes to you and says they need a website, they actually need a lot more. <laughs> they need messaging, they need branding, and they probably need something outside of whatever that website's delivering. Um, you know, and there are companies that do this really well. You know, service industries like hotel industries do this really well. You know, trying to get through a presentation without bringing up Apple, but you know, they do it really well. Um, but then think about some other experiences. Think about, for instance, Ikea, okay? Great app, Real, you can find the specific thing that you want. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there, and their, their shipping, at least where I am in Massachusetts, is really, really expensive. So you, you go to the store. So you've got a great experience. You found what you need, it's affordable. I'm gonna go, hey, it's in this bin at, in Stoughton, Massachusetts. You enter Ikea on Saturday afternoon, and it is hell on earth because everybody is there, it is, and you try to walk through, 
and it's 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 got it's got no clocks and no windows. It's like a casino without the gambling. So it's just this really it's it's this part of the experience that just you know really is lacking. And so when we think about this, we have to ask our clients, what is the human experience outside of what you're asking us to do? What are their thoughts? What is their mood? We've already set them up on this app. We've already set them up to do this, and we're going to send them to a store. What, how do we continue that experience? And I think it's our job as human experience specialists to really figure that out and to at least ask those questions. This one, I think, is our favorite. Uh, a little challenge is OK. And this one's really tough with clients. Um, <laughs> you know, there is a such thing as having something be a little too easy. And there are a lot of examples of this. Um, I think one of the, um, an example I think from, from at least a digital perspective, you think of Mint.com. Mint.com is not going to make you save money. It's not going to do it all for you. You have to be responsible enough to input the information. And what that in turn does is it gives you a sense of ownership on your experience, a sense of ownership onto your own content. It's OK to have an experience that makes you want to journey a little bit and have some accidental learning along the way. Whether that's an e-commerce site, oh wow, they have this product too. Or maybe it's an informational site. You know, we worked on a site uh, years ago for financial education. And in that experience, we purposely built that experience thinking about if I'm somebody who comes to this site and I want to know about debt consolidation, what other things do I want to know? How do I want to feel? I want to be benchmarked and know that I'm not alone in having bad credit and twenty thousand dollars of debt. Where do we in that journey put in that information? And another thing too is, is I think it's important to note there's a lot of talk about um, robotic automation, a lot of automation now, and by and large that's a good thing. But this is an example again of where things get too easy, and I think we have to ask our clients this. You know, and I think this is this is a I, I talk about this um, particular example. Um, because I think it illustrates the point. You've probably heard about this or at least maybe you've read about it, but you know, um, you think about the Air France disaster a few years ago, so I think it was 2009. And in that plane, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that was a plane, I think it was from Brazil uh, to France. And they were cruising at 40,000 feet, and the pitot tubes, which are the tubes that kind of, I think they, they, they measure the, the, the forward speed, they froze over, which happens all the time. It was a minor glitch. And what that caused the pilots to do was to figure out, oh, we need to, we need to fly this plane manually. And they panicked. They panicked. They did exactly the wrong things. They didn't communicate with each other. The human experience, the human communication element was non-existent. The automation of the cockpit fixed itself within a few minutes. But they were scrambling so much. And, he, and one, of the, one of the pilots was pulling, I think he was pulling up you know, uh, uh, no, whatever that is, pulling that up, which is actually causing the plane to plummet. Plane crashed. The plane was completely fine. There was no problem with the automation. These are the things that, as human experience specialists, we need to ask. We need to ask these things so that we, our clients, can see the full picture. Is this automation really going to be helpful? What kind of auto, what kind of ownership do we want to give uh, the person who's engaging with your experience? And so. To think about this in terms of a, of a kind of a visual model, this is how we approach our, pro our projects. You know, on the one end, you have digital experiences, and on the other end, you have tangible experiences, just for the sake of argument. And when you look at a project, where does your particular project fall in? And it's our opinion that really nothing actually falls completely on digital experiences, and nothing ever completely falls within tangible experiences. It probably falls somewhere along the spectrum. If you think about healthcare.gov, that was mentioned in a workshop yesterday. Sure, that's a digital experience, but it does not fall 100% in that blue because of all the human emotions that come to that website before the person even engages with it. And those are the things that we need to do. And when we start to research and design, this is how we have to start asking questions, which goes into our case studies. So one of our clients, um, Pegasystems, they develop um, CRM software. And uh, we do a number of projects with them. They're a great client. And last year, we were asked to do some usability testing. 
And so we did, uh, you know, we did some uh, pre-surveys, post-surveys, and we did the kind of standard usability studies. You know, we want to take a look at many of their different experiences, their product pages, their home page, and we really wanted to get a sense of how people were navigating, how the conceptual model worked, information architecture terminology, and that was all useful, all important data. But what we really learned was, is that every single participant that came here to this study was exhausted. Like the most, I've done hundreds of usability tests. These were the most tired cohort I'd ever seen. Bags under their eyes, even tired during the, the, the interviews. These were IT directors, these were operations managers at companies that were, that, that, you know, everything had to be due yesterday. And that ended up being the biggest finding. Because they would say things such as, oh yeah, I would love some more choices on this. No, they didn't. They didn't want more choices on the website. They just wanted the right choice. They wanted the right choice because they did not have the time or the energy to sift through a lot of content. And then our future projects, it was really based on that. You have an audience that is, has high expertise. By the way, when we talk about some of the, the heuristics before about you know, context matters and about digital as part of a larger experience, these were people that would go on their desktop, take a picture of something, a screenshot, and then write on it and give it to their boss who signs the check for software. We needed to know that. They weren't doing it on their phone. And so that helped us frame the design, um, helped frame the experience. And one of the learnings we have about this is that in every usability study that we do now, we always ask, the upfront part of it is we ask them to really talk about what their work day is like, what their commute is like, What's the end of day like? I had a, one of my first mentors years ago, she said, you know, the best thing about doing any kind of user interview is that they let you into their lives. And I never forgot that. And once they do that, you have an idea that it's not about the website. I mean, it is, you wanna make sure the information is there, don't get me wrong. But it's really about the mindset at which they're coming to this site. And too often we start to forget those things. We start to do too much remote usability testing, which again has its purpose, but until you're sitting with someone right in front of them and you're understanding what their lives are like, not only can you then frame the probes the right way after you've started your research, not only can you figure out what their daily lives are like, but they've just given you a persona that is different than the personas we're all used to. Like I already know if someone's an IT director, they're this age, they're this background, they've been this long in the industry, they seem great on paper, but when they walk in exhausted, I'm not sure if they like that background. I'm not sure if they like what they're doing. So they give you this kind of 24-hour persona, which is so crucial to building human experiences. Because you know what their day is like, you know what their frustrations are like, you know what they like, you know what's important about their job, what they love about their job, you know when you can interrupt them, when you absolutely must never interrupt them. These things are important. And so every time we do a research study, we build in those questions up front. And it helps us understand them as human beings. And so many times we do usability tests before we start that, and we don't know who that person was. How can you design for them if you know who they are? I mean, really, who they are is emotional people. And that, is, and that has really enriched a lot of our work and a lot of how we approach our designs. So case study two, this was really exciting uh, from my point of view as a designer, visual communication designer. Uh, we were asked to create signs uh, for Noor, a new grocery store concept. Um, and to someone that's just asking for signs, it's sort of the same concept of asking for a website. You're really asking for more than just signs. And in this case, we talked with our client and we came to the agreement that not only do we need signage, but we need the research to, in order, in order to have us understand who the people are who are coming in to the store and design the right way for them. So with our client, we were able to do a field study within the grocery store and uh, some surveys and then design some signage. These are actually two examples of the signs that we created for them that would be seen in the windows um, using some of the foods that were found within the store itself. What's amazing about this grocery store is that they take food that would otherwise be thrown out 
and they put it in the store and they have these foods be at affordable costs and they're all healthy. So you're not seeing any sodas or candies or anything within this store. It's in Dorchester, Massachusetts, which is not really known for having a lot of healthy food options at an affordable cost. So this is a sample on the bottom left. You'll see what the store looks like, some of the foods inside, and some of the people, some of the shoppers, some of the workers, they collaborated. We found through the field study that these people were incredibly social within a grocery store, which was not something that we would have expected. So while we were studying how people were interacting, we were able to see the kinds of questions that they would ask each other and the kinds of interactions that they would have. So we created these four signs to really emphasize their own communication of exploration of what new foods were to them. So flavors that might inspire them, prices that might empower them, ingredients that satisfy, and options that fulfill. All things that might have not been options before Daily Table came to its initial launch. And just a note on, on the nerdy design end, we chose to use some of this uh, old sign uh, lettering that was like the 1950s lettering. But really, the dominant piece within these, these signs are about the food. And then you sort of see, as a subordinate element, what they're saying if you look close enough. And so as designers, we're thinking, as, as communication artists, we're thinking in terms of the elements of design and the principles of design. And things like lines and shapes, direction, scale, texture, color, value, this is what you learn when you go to graphic design school. And then things like the balance, emphasis, movement, pattern, repetition, proportion, rhythm, variety, and unity that brings the communication together that reflects the research that we do through the field studies through the through any kind of research that we'll do. Yeah, and just to, just to add on that too is, I think the important part of the daily table case study too, or another important part of that, is as researchers and designers, we went in with our own you know, pre preconceived set of, of notions. You know, um, like Amy said, we, we didn't expect that a grocery store would be so communal. You know, even when we were, do, were doing our field study, people coming up to us and, and, and you know, and saying, what, what, what vegetable is that? You know, or we had in the surveys, and we did a set of, of paper surveys too. And one of the, someone wrote down, I'm eating healthy for the first time in my life. That is an emotional finding. You know, we could have done the wayfinding and put the signage up, great. Here's, here's the invoice, let's go home. But it was a completely different um, mode of human communication that informed us, and that informed a lot of the design decisions that we made. Everything from the colors that we use to the fonts that we use. And all of it came from talking to people and observing people and how they interact outside of the digital world. And so with that, you know, our belief really is, you know, this, this is what we do know with all the questions we have, that we think monetary ROI comes when you understand the context in which people live their lives. You know, if someone asks for a website, you know, you can do a website. You might get some great conversion in the first quarter. But what happens in the second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter? How do we maintain uh, the relationship with the human beings that are engaging with your product? And that's where we come in. And I, again, I want to stress, it's not that we are opposed to quantitative data. It's not where, I mean, those tools, we can't do our job without those tools. But in the age of big data, in the age of getting things done as quickly as possible, some of this element of understanding how people communicate gets lost. And, um, and I think in those two case studies, and now from that work, we've been able to really build in some more of that research in the work that we do. So again, um, questions, to be, questions to be asked. Uh, this, is, this is a gray area. We operate in the gray area. We're proud of it. Um, but it's not easy. <laughs> and uh, we open the floor for any questions or discussion. Uh, yep. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate the, um, the effort to bring it back to the community and have mm -hmm. the community that it's that critically important in our industry, the, the world we live in, and our responsibility to that. Um, I, I want to suggest uh, uh, something because I give this a lot of thought. And I think that there's a key. 
key missing piece here of, um, you know, I'm coming from it in more of a philosophical, humanistic um, uh, perspective. And I feel that um, a lot of what you talked about is very solutions focused. And that's what our industry is. Like, we're very solutions focused. And so, you know, like you, in the core basics, you know, you've got it immerses you, you know, but then to what goal, right? right. And then, you know, and you can go through all of those uh, with that. And I'm curious, because I've been trying to think of how, you know, we can be thinking more humanistically uh, about, you know, core human values that we want to promote or should be promoting with our technology, core human goals that we should be, you know, to elevate humanity, right? Um, and, you know, somebody in the company should be um, being a proponent of this, I feel, and um, it should be a designer, you know, is at least where I'm at. Um, and so a good example of this would be like social media, which is, you know, largely optimized for the human desire of passing judgment. Um, but, you know, what about the, um, the core need, to, you know, in facilitating open, honest dialogue of forgiveness, right? And it's something that's not in the conversation very often or maybe never. Um, and so I'm just curious what your thoughts are there about expanding you know, like I think there's one step back that you could be taking sure. uh, that's missing. Um, I think part of it, and this is this is going to sound like a cop out. It's not. Um, one of the reasons we start our own company is we can decide what kind of work to do. We can decide what clients we want to work with. I, you know, I hinted at it um, earlier about automation. I think part of that kind of humanistic uh, perspective and that kind of um, doing the right work comes from saying no to the wrong work. So, you know, we hear about driverless trucks, for instance, you know, big rigs. That's six million jobs. You know, so as, as designers or as um, experience, you know, experience specialists, or I'm still struggling with whatever my title is, I don't know. Um, we have to say no to some kinds of work. Sometimes you can't, go down, you can't go down the path of doing work and saying, you know, um, maybe we shouldn't do that after all. Sometimes if the motive, the end motive, the end goal is not something that we think is good for humanity, we can say no thanks. And by the way, we have. You know, I think that is one initial step. Um, and then I also think that when you're, if you are in a project and sometimes it gets a little too monetarily focused, um, let's cut that part of the research out. I think we just say, no, we can't do that unless we do this part of the project first, unless we talk to people. But for us, again, sounds like a cop-out, we just say no. We just say no. And, and, and I think in that type of work, when it's talking about the elimination of jobs, which I think is very important for everyone in this room, you know, when we're asked to design things, as things get more automated, we're talking about millions and millions of jobs. And I think that's something that we have to, that's where the social consciousness comes in. Any other questions? We're a nonprofit. Although we serve lots of humans because our humans that come to our digital experience could be patients or patient families, the humans I really serve are our donors and our peer to peer fundraisers. And we're the opposite of IKEA. The apex of our tangible experience is amazing and mind-blowing and life-changing. And we sort of, the brilliant minds that hang around and talk about this, we have two um, sort of thoughts of how we show that kind of experience digitally. One is we recreate it. So we take everyone on this grand tour of the hospital and all the science and all the patients and everything. That's really hard. And then the other idea is what we want to do is distill that experience. It's once in a lifetime. There's only one of us. You have to come to Memphis. The hospital is mind blowing. The science is crazy. And we do it all without charging anyone. You have to distill that experience into something that you deliver digitally. Do you have thoughts about that? Good question. That's a great question. <laughs> so are you talking about like really the, the, the kind of almost spatial experience and what everything that's there to offer? It's a feeling that people want yep. to take a tour of our hospital or our center. Yep. Versus doing a just plan to find out about it. Yeah. So actually at St. Jude's, the actual tangible, yes. yeah. Um, 
Uh, that's a good question. I, I think for for us, it's it, it, I would bring it back just to, just in this conversation, just to and this is just a guess. I would bring it back to that almost 24 hour plus persona. What is that? What is that actual journey like? It's not so much the content they need to see, as it is what's that emotional experience. Um, you know, where was just I think it's in um, Cincinnati, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. They have an incredible. They're, they're known for their waiting room experience. And if you look at um, some of the comments on Facebook, it's like, I had no idea that this could be so immersive. And that, in turn, is actually what they've gotten to be known for, is that you know, there's a high stress, excuse me, this high stress environment, and this is a children's hospital, I believe, I'd have to check, but children's hospital, high stress environment, but there's gaming on the wall. There's something that the, what you thought it might be is completely transformed. So sometimes that emotional piece is just one thing you might do at your location. Instead of thinking about the holistic experience, maybe it's just one thing that speaks to everything that's on your website. Something that might get people talking. Something that is, is totally different than what they expected. And all that totally answers your question, but I think sometimes we think too broadly about we've got all these goals and we've got all these experiences and we do science great and we do customer service great. Choose what you do really great and make something really cool about that. You know, and the other stuff people will learn is that we mentioned accidental learning before, they'll learn along the way. And so, I mean, I have no idea really about, for Cincinnati, the quality of care. You know, I have no, I, honestly, I don't know, but I know they got a hell of a waiting room that people talk about. So sometimes it's that one thing, that one spatial thing that, that should be emphasized. Um, so I have a question about um, consistent branding versus customization and tailoring to like local audience. So I work for global marketing for major automotive, um, Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. And we are responsible for implementing websites across the globe. And we're constantly facing this challenge. Do we stick to one consistent approach across, across all markets and stick to the you know, constant look and feel and brand positioning? Or do we allow, like, what is the degree of customizations we should allow for markets? How would you? That's a great that? question. I think uh, in the design realm, that's always a case-to-case -case, uh, kind of question. If it's a really good brand, it should work uh, across different cultures. But sometimes you have to tweak. For instance, the color red means something completely different in an Asian country versus in America. And there are associations with that. Um, some companies do it well. Some companies do not. But ultimately, a brand is successful not because of the visual design, but because of what the brand stands for and how people take away, what they take away from that. So if it's, you know, it could be the worst logo ever, but they ha if they have a great product or a great service, it's going to be recognizable. So it's therefore a successful brand. So I've noticed this trend, too, of big data kind of sneaking in places where maybe it shouldn't be so much. <laughs> so for example, you're, you're trying to create something brand new that doesn't exist. And you know we have clients saying, show me the data that what you're proposing is going to work. And what, what they mean by data is you know percentages, numbers, sure. right? Very quantitative. But I mean, our, our data is a little more qualitative. And really, some of it is guessing. You're just like making your mm -hmm. best guess. And you can't really test it until it's out there. Right. Um, or you know, you can do some testing, but usually it's qualitative at that point. So I guess my question is, how do you, how do you combat that instinct for, of people to like back this up with data? Mm -hmm. um, well, you, you have the data. And then basically you say, yeah, we're going to do that. You're going to get your numbers. But we, we have to, we have to uh, validate those numbers with talking to people. And when there's a discrepancy, here's in, in my experience, and I don't know if this is, but when there's a discrepancy between um, what the data says, the quantitative data says, and what we learned when we talked to people, the client overwhelmingly listens to what we heard when we talked to people. So whenever, and this is kind of a best case scenario, like if you can do quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis at the same time, that's a really winning position. 
because sometimes you will see, and I think it's a simple, just for the sake of argument, time on site. You know, wow, they're really exploring. They're looking at all the paid media. It's great. Well, I talked to 12 out of 12 people, and we use this methodology, and they are on, they're spending time on site because they can't find what they're looking for. No longer is that data relevant. Well, it's relevant, but now, like, oh, we need to talk to people. This is actually designed for humans. So when you can try to do it at the same time, um, that often works. Now, if you can't do it at the same time, often it's just a pre and post. It's kind of let's do some initial surveys, whatever that metric, whatever whatever that that methodology might be. Let's build some prototypes. And the power that we have as a designer and researcher is we will just kind of put together some prototypes or mock-ups, do some qualitative testing, and if that's consistent with some of the pre-survey data, then we can march forward. If it's not, it's okay. Hold on, we need to talk to more people about what they actually want. So it's whenever you can add some kind of qualitative element to it. Again, I have found in the clients that we've worked with, once you, in the absence of qualitative data, the numbers are everything. You're right, I need numbers, I need them yesterday. When you have solid qualitative data and you have, and, you, and you've done it, you know, not anecdotally, but you've done it the right way, you say, okay, we need to talk to more people. You don't always have that situation, but that's, that's the approach we always try to take. Hi, um, my name is June. I'm from New York City. I work for a company called AppNexus. Uh, we are an enterprise software company, and we do realize that designing for human, making it more exceptional and emotional is very important. But as a company that specifies into very specific type of users, it's always very difficult because we focus on efficiency, we focus on a lot of instrumental values, and those are our priorities, uh, not the um, human-oriented design. Mm -hmm. So for a company like us, what kind of approaches or tactics that would you recommend mm -hmm. um, to actually combat this, um, this homework that we have? Sure. Um, so for that, for that situation, I think, you know, that's, that's where it's on us to say, this is what we've learned from the emotional side. So in the case we mentioned about Pegasystems, they're exhausted. They say they want a lot of choices. They don't. You know, they sit, what we found is they need some quick interactive experiences that get them to the conversion path. Something that's outside of the dot-com experience. Something that can be easily shared. Five steps on a screen, boom, boom, boom. Conversion, request a demo, we've got someone at your office. So it's, what, we, what we try to do is take that emotional research and then say, how do we know if they're exhausted, that they're gonna do this on a desktop, how can we create something that's gonna be useful for them to benchmark themselves with the industry so that they can then convert for you. And that's how we translate those, those two pieces. Because you're right, our clients, you know, okay, they're tired, great, I need to sell product. <laughs> you know, that's where the design comes in. And in thinking about Daily Table before, it's the same situation. It's, okay, they talk to each other, great, I still need signage. Well, you need signage that's gonna show some, some, some uh, foods they've never had before. That's what's gonna get them in. Okay, fine, that's great, do it. And that's, that's how it's a win for us. And that's ultimately why we're hired. So. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.